Happy Sunday, Remnant Church. Today's scripture is from Galatians 1, 6 through 16. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it for I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tra traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Happy Sunday, everybody. Um, I am really enjoying my alone time uh, with the Lord. Four more days, and then life goes back to happiness, right? <laughs> I have spies in here who tell on me. So, um, We've been talking about uh, making things new, that God would create in us a new heart, a clean heart. And starting this week, we're going to start to go through the book of Galatians. And the Galatians is a book where Paul is writing with a very strong emotion because uh, he's very frustrated at what is going on in his beloved church. And if you want to know kind of like the background story of how the church in Galatia and you know the regions, if you want to read Acts 13 and 14, that's their story of how they came to be. Uh, but you know this is a book that really spells out for us that salvation is not through works, but it is the grace of God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came as the fulfillment of the law, and we are no longer required to, required to fulfill the law because God knows we cannot. The function of the law was never intended for us to fulfill it. The function was it for us to realize, oh, it's not something I can do. It is something which... Help me to understand, I need a savior. I need someone to save me because I cannot save myself. And through the book of Galatians, we're going to understand that whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, you know, Hebrew, Greek, it doesn't matter. We all belong to the family of God as his beloved children. And so this is a bit very uh, precious book. Uh, and this is a letter that Paul is writing with a lot of emotion because he loves these people Yet he is so dismayed that these people so quickly turn from the genuine gospel of Jesus Christ and embrace the philosophy of legalism, that they began to listen to these Jewish people who came down without Paul's invitation and started to teach and demand, actually, you have to keep the Torah. You have to obey the laws that we were given. You have to live as gen uh, not as Gentiles, but as Jewish people. You actually have to be circumcised. And Paul was so dismayed that these people were so quick to believe that and to turn away from the gospel of grace. It is not through works. And so Verse 6, he starts out like that. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, right? Their version of the gospel is legalism. And if you want to define legalism, very briefly, it's good behavior with wrong understanding. That's legalism. 
See, the wrong understanding is this. Oh, if I keep the law, if I do these things, then I will be accepted, I will be loved, I will be valuable. That's the wrong understanding, but you do the, you have the good behavior. You, you know, you're loving, you're helping, you're tithing, you know, serving, good behavior, and you think, oh, because I have these good behavior, I will be saved. No, you do not. Because you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You, you are saved by faith, not through your deeds, right? And so when we're thinking about these people, Galatians, how come they were so quick to turn away from the gospel of Jesus Christ? And Paul is so dismayed, but I feel like as a uh, son of an uh, immigrant father, I think I understand, right? Uh, a lot of you don't understand, but in the 70s and 80s, uh, New York and LA, we had a lot of people that used to label us as FOBs, fresh off the boat, right? So, you know, we are coming to America as immigrants, like, I don't know, late uh, elementary, early junior high, and, you know, we don't really know the culture, we don't really speak English that well. Uh, but when we got here, there were already people, like say, like Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, who'd been here, who were born here, and they spoke fluent English, and you know, they looked so much cooler, and they would label us, you're FOB, you know, based on your accent, and based on you know, your inability to speak English, and so I, so people ask me, right, Pastor Joe, you've been here like 40 plus years, uh, so you, you must be so fluent in English. When did you start speaking English so well, and my honest answer would be, I'm still learning. I am still not fully uh, confident that I'm very fluent, you know. Uh, but if you ask me, how about Korean? I, I've been fluent ever since I was born. I've always been fluent in Korean, except when I was 14 years old. When I was 14 years old, this is one year after coming to America, and I was under a lot of stress to fit in, to be cool, and I noticed that a lot of kids who were born here, the second gen kids, you know, who were fluent in English, their Korean was terrible. They sounded really off, but I was like, oh, I need to speak like that, <laughs> right? So I would talk to my mom like that, you know, like, 아니, well, 선생님가 너무 two face yeah, you know? And my mom said, like, speak right, what are you doing, right? And, and I was like, I'm just trying to fit in. I'm just trying to sound like them so that I would be accepted, right? And so I purposely tried to speak very poor English because I couldn't reach the standard of their fluency in English. You guys understand what I'm saying? And I think Galatian people were under the same pressure because these Jewish people are coming. Hey, we have thousands of history with God. Do you know that we have... Old Testament, there are 39 books. Do you know the Torah? Do you know the law? You don't know anything. You don't know our language. You don't know our culture. You don't know the law. You're not a true Christian. And they're like, oh, we don't know anything. We, we didn't even know there was Old Testament. Like, we had to keep what? Like, Paul didn't tell us these things. And they're like, okay, let us teach you. And you have to obey these things to be true Christians. And you have to be circumcised. And you have to do this and this. And they're like, oh, man, if I don't do what they say, I I'm really going to be the second-rate citizen. You know, and they come at you with, like, we are the chosen people. God chose us. God called our father Abraham. We are the chosen people. You're Gentiles. You know, and so they had a lot of pressure and angst, like, oh, if we don't do what they say, we're not really going to belong. And so they quickly started to embrace their demand for legalism. And Paul is saying, you cannot allow them to distort the gospel. You cannot allow them to distort the one and only gospel, one true gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross after living the perfect life to give to us, right? And so, verse 7, he goes on to say, not that there is another one. There is no other gospel, Paul says. 
But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And that's a, that's a very strong, very violent word that you would be cursed forever by God, right? Let him be cursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And there is only one gospel, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is we are saved through faith and faith alone. That we are not able to save ourselves. We cannot atone for our own sins. And we are not made just through keeping of the law. He's going to go on to say in Galatians chapter 2, right? And so all these things that we were unable to do, they're putting the same yoke on you and making you do that even though they themselves were not able to do this. And that is the very reason why Jesus Christ came. And sometimes the distorted gospel can be more attractive. Sometimes the distorted gospel can make us feel like, oh, I think I feel holier. I think I feel better about myself because of the demands, and I get to check it off. Right? There is this program that I use. It's from Microsoft. It's called To Do. Do you guys use that? Right? And it, you know, it's got like things you need to do, and then it's got these score boxes. And then when you complete a task, like I, I use it as a shopping list and everything, and I, I click on it, and then it does a check, and then it draws a line through it, and then tick, disappears. Such a satisfying thing. <laughs> right? oh, I, I accomplished something. I bought tofu today, baby. Right? It's like I accomplished something. Right? And, and we like to feel accomplished. And when you make your Christianity into a list of to-dos, you can feel accomplished. You can check off these boxes every day. Read a chapter of the Bible, click. I, read, I prayed five minutes, click. You know, I helped out somebody, click. You know, I forgave my unknowing sister, click. Right? And, and, and the more things you can click, the more you feel good about yourself. But see, you're coming at it from wrong understanding. You have good behavior, but you're coming at it from wrong understanding. This is the bondage, and this is my prayer, that after we're done with the book of Galatians, that we would be set free from this bondage, that you have to be better, you have to do more in order for God to love you and accept you. A lot of us are still under this bondage. Right now, I'm the ugly duckling, but one day I will be good enough so that God will say, wow, you're a swan, you're beautiful, finally. No, you are already, even now, accepted by God and loved by God. That's why Jesus came for us. It is not through good works. It is not through your achievements or keeping of the law. It is through grace. The question is, do you believe it? Do you accept it? Do you embrace it? That is why Paul says in chapter 2 of Galatians 16, so emphatically, right? He says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I mean, can you say it any more plainly, any more clearly, that we are not justified by works of the law? You're not loved by God more than you are already being loved by him when you do more? That's not the demand from God. God is not saying, 
Man, my love for you is at 50%, but I can move it up to 65% if you would only do X, Y, Z. That's not what, what's going on. Like, I raised two boys, you know, and both of them are in college, and they went through teenage years. And never one moment, one moment in me raising them through those turbulent seasons, I was not thinking, man, I only love you 30% right now. And if you shape up, I would love you 65%. No. Even though I was frustrated, even though I was not happy, my love for them was 100% maximum all the time. My love for my son, my love for my wife is not based on their behavior or their achievements. And I know that sometimes because of what we hear, because of what we experience, you know, we can have that jadedness where we feel like, no, I think God loves me only when I'm good, only when I'm perfect. And right now, I'm neither, and so I, I don't think God loves me. And you know, that is the lie of the enemy, and that is what Paul is trying to steer us away from into God's very freeing truth. So Paul emphatically proclaimed that there is no other gospel. And my question to you is this, do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or do you believe in the other gospels? Where there are a bunch of demands and requirements. That you have to be a certain way, and you have to do certain things, and you have to achieve so many things for God to know you, notice you, love you, accept you. And as Paul says, those are the lies from the enemy. Those are the distorted gospels that we must reject. Because Paul says very plain, hey guys, the gospel that I preached to you, it didn't come from my head. I didn't think this up. I didn't learn this somewhere. No, this was something Jesus Christ personally revealed to me. This is from the Lord straight. This is not based on man's wisdom and man's philosophy and man's research. No, this is from God. God is telling us that this is the only way to be saved. So verse 10, it says, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he's talking about two things here. Number one, are you seeking God's approval or this world's approval? Because this is very important. Based on whose approval you're seeking, your lifestyle is going to change tremendously. You're seek, if you're seeking God's approval, then your life will be filled with grace because that's what he offers to you. Hey, my love for you is grace. My love for you is undeserved love for you. There's no requirement. You simply believe it and receive it. See, if you're seeking God's approval, then it's grace, it's rest, it's peace. But if you're seeking man's approval, if you're seeking this world's approval, it's going to come with a list of requirements. It's going to come with a list of requirements. How much do you make in a year? What school did you go to? What kind of resume do you have? How are you portrayed on LinkedIn? You know, like, do people like you on social media? What kind of skill sets do you have? You have all these things. If you're seeking this world's approval, it's not only going to have a list of things that you must meet in order for you to feel like you belong, and then it's going to demand that you start 
agreeing with their values. Why do you think Paul says in Romans 1.16, right? The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? It is the power to save to those who believe. But there are people who are ashamed of the gospel because you feel the pressure from the society. How come Christians are so bigoted and so narrow-minded? How come they say theirs is the only way? And how come, how come, how come? And you're like, well, maybe it is not the only way. Well, maybe there are other ways. And you start to compromise. You start to buy in. And not only are you rejecting God's grace, but you are signing up to a life that is very demanding and list of things that you cannot possibly keep up. Apostle Paul is very clear. The Bible is very clear. It is not something that is made up by human intelligence or human wisdom or experience, but the gospel was the great mystery, the great plan of salvation which God had in place from the moment when Adam and Steve were discovered with sin, God had already put into motion how to save mankind through his son, Jesus Christ. And so I ask you, in your journey as a child of God? Are you seeking to please God? Are you seeking to honor God? Or in reality, deep down in your heart, are you seeking man's approval, man's acceptance? Right? Jesus said it like this in John 12, 43. He says, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And we can exchange, you know, for they love the acceptance that comes from man more than the acceptance, more than the approval that comes from God. You know, when we are teenagers and, you know, we're still growing and maturing and, like, we're very tunnel-visioned and limited in what we think and how we understand and how we perceive things. They say if you ask a seventh-grade girl, how many friends do you have, best friends do you have, she'll say 200. But then when she becomes like a junior in high school, that number dwindles drastically, less than 10, right? And as you graduate high school, if you have more than five, you did a good job. I mean, how many of you feel like as you were graduating high school, you had five BFFs, you know? That's a hard thing to do. But during those formative years, and it, when, when you're just like trying to figure out friendship and popularity and all this, to you, what is most important is being liked by your friends and being remembered by your friends and put all your eggs in that basket. And it doesn't matter if you get into a fight with your mom. It doesn't matter if your grades drop. It doesn't matter if you're just being a very terrible child and hurting people. As long as you have your friends, as long as you have your crew that you hang with, you're good, right? But when you come out of this stage and you're like post-college and you're all adult and you, you know, you're getting married and you look back on those years and like, wow, I did some like foolish things. What I thought were important, not very important. And I made some foolish sacrifices going after 
things that were not really valuable. Right? And we may be doing the same thing in our walk with Jesus Christ. We may think that this world's validation and acceptance and approval of me. And I get it because it's more tangible, right? You feel it. It's more valuable than God's approval and his acceptance and the value that he gives, me, gives to me as his son, as his daughter. Brothers and sisters, we should never be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. And there is no distinction because he gave that salvation to Jews first and then to the Gentiles and there is no distinction. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, if you're a Greek, if you're a Gentile, Samaritan, Asian. It doesn't matter. God loves us as his beloved sons and daughters because of what Christ has done. And then Paul, he shifts gears and he kind of takes them back and says, hey, remember what I told you about who I was? And I want you to understand what has happened to me and how that became possible. Right? Verse 13, he goes on to say, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. You know, it's, it's not like anybody talking about, oh yeah, I was, I was pretty wild when I was young. You know, it, it's not like, oh yeah, when I was in high school, I used to cut classes and, you know, like sneak out and drink beer and smoke pot. It, it, it's not like that. That's not what Paul said. Paul says, I try to destroy God's church. I kill people. I put people in prison. I destroy families. I burn the church down. You know what I mean? It's like serious stuff. Paul said, I, in today's terms, I was a terrorist. I did some violent, violent things. And then he says, do you know why I did those things? Do you know why I was like that? Verse 14. Because I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Right? It's because I was bound by legalism. I was advancing well beyond my peers. I was doing more. I was doing better. I was so zealous. I was going to be the best law keeper. I was going to be the best Pharisee. I was going to be the most righteous person through my deeds. Yet when he was bound so tightly and most advanced in his legalism, the result was what? He killed people. He burned God's church down. He destroyed families. He threw people in prison unjustly. That is what Paul's saying. When I was at the height of legalism, when I was the best law keeper of the land, when I was the best Pharisee, I was the most hurtful person. I was the most destructive person. And then God turned me around. God turned me around and Jesus met me. He met me on the way to Damascus. And, it, you know, this is his life that was turned around. Verse 15, he says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, this is when life turned around. Do you notice that there's nothing about what Paul did? Paul said, oh man, I realized what a sinner I was. I began to pray. I began to fast. I was tithing. I was serving. I was mopping floors. 
And then God called, no. There's no merit on Paul's part. There's no merit. Paul was not being holy. Paul was not being godly. Paul was not reading Bibles. And, no, he was on a horse going down to kill more Christians. But God had a plan. God had chosen him. God had chosen Paul before he was even born, when he was still in his mother's womb. God says, Paul, I have called you as my messenger to the Gentiles. See, this is grace. And this is the result of grace. What a stark contrast. A guy who was bound up in legalism, who was the best law keeper in the land, and his fruits were a lot of destruction, a lot of brokenness. Yet, when he was given over to God's grace, and when he embraced this gospel, not only did his life change, but the trajectory and the fruit of his life changed. He began to bring life, salvation, freedom, healing, and joy into the lives of those who were without hope, who were without joy, who were without promise. People, Gentiles, who were far away from God, people who were not even allowed to enter into the temple of God, yet now they are allowed to go straight into the holy of holies, the most sacred place. And so, Paul is saying to Galatians, Galatians, do not allow them to take from you this gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not allow them to distort this gospel and do not voluntarily allow the gospel that you receive from Jesus to be distorted because of the pressure that you feel, because of the need that you have to belong, to be liked. No, we must honor and respect and revere the word of God. We cannot be creative and imaginative in how we read and translate and interpret the Bible. That is very wrong. The way we interpret the Bible, it has to be contextual. It has to be historical. And it has to be grammatical. And it has to fit in the paradigm. You cannot just be imaginative. You cannot just be creative because then you will have no stability and the Bible will have no authority. God's truth, his life-giving gospel is laid out for us. And the temptation from the world is if you follow us and if you give us just a segment of the gospel, we to tweak it a little bit, we will like you, we will welcome you, we will celebrate you. But no, brothers, it should not be. There is no other gospel. We believe in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe in the authority and the authenticity of the Bible that is given to us. May we not seek the approval of men, but let us seek and receive the acceptance and approval God already gives to us as his sons and daughters. Let's pray. I want us to focus on uh, two things. Number one, <clears throat> that we would really recognize whether we are receiving and believing and living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or somehow we have allowed the Bible 
gospel to be tainted. And we are seeking health and wealth and acceptance of this world. And the second question just follows right after. Are you seeking to please God and honor God? Or are you seeking to honor men and please men? What life are you choosing to live? So let's go before God and let's pray. Let's pray together. righteous and we become sons and daughters of God. Father, may we not live a life that allows the pressures of this world to distort the gospel that you have given to us. And Lord, let us see the reality of living in your grace living in your freedom, living in the peace which transcends all understanding compared to the life of legalism, a list of do's and don'ts, never-ending demands that we can never satisfy. Oh, Heavenly Father, would you help us to live our lives to please you and to bring you glory and that we would not struggle and be fearful and frustrated in trying to please this world. May we live as sons and daughters of God. May we live a life that brings you glory. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise. Let's worship the Lord together.